more reading of the uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. This will be the third video. Um, this is the book that I am getting all these ideas from. Um, Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It was uh, very popular in Latin America. They was actually uh, copying them and passing them around uh, as contraband since it was illegal. Um, I'm also, also using uh, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Uh, his notes, he's a, uh, I'm not sure where he's actually a doctor at, but jasonjcampbell.org forward slash ball log dot php. Uh, he has an outline which uh, made it a little easier to read. I also found that comic book for the Spider Jerusalem. It's called Trans uh, Metropola. Metropolitan, Transmetropolitan, <laughs> Transmetropolitan, oh fuck, I'm fucking that all up, Transmetropolitan, 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 back on the street, so Transmetropolitan, uh, that's Spider Jerusalem, and he called anybody with a modicum of authority, um, I don't know, a slimy rat piece of shit or something. <laughs> it's in the very beginning. He's coming down off the hill. And the guy is like, Oh, yeah. But really, you really are everything I moved to the mountain to escape from. A worthless scrap of frog shit with a pulse and a bit of authority. So, Spider Jerusalem. Let's see, so, okay, what else we got here? We got, um,. Talking about the dialogue, and this the dialogue is a way of knowing. It's a way of knowing. The reason why I engage in dialogue is not necessarily because I like the other person. I engage in dialogue because I recognize the social and the individualistic character of the process of knowing. In this sense, dialogue represents itself as an indispensable component of the process of both learning and knowing. Page 17, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Hegel says that it's solely about risking the life that freedom is obtained. The individual who's not staked to his or her life may no doubt be recognized as a person, but he or she has not attained the truth of this recognition as an independent self-consciousness. In order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but restorers of the humanity of both. This is a great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. For freedom to be universal, the oppressors who oppress, exploit, and rape by virtue of their power cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. Only the power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong enough to free them both. It's a rare peasant who, once promoted to overseer, does not become more of a tyrant towards his former comrades than the owner himself. Freedom is the indispensable condition for the quest of human completion. This fight, because of the purpose given to it by the oppressed, will actually constitute an act of love, opposed, opposing the lovelessness which lies at the heart of the oppressor's violence. In order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation which they can transform. Page 49. The oppressed suffer from the duality which has established itself in their innermost being. They discover that without freedom they cannot exist authentically, yet although they desire authentic existence, they also fear it. They're at once and at the same times, at the same time, they're at one and at the same time themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they've, they've internalized. The conflict lies in the choice between being holy themselves or being divided, between ejecting the oppressor within or not ejecting them. Between human solidarity or alienation, between fallen orders or having choices, between being spectators or actors, between acting or having the illusion of acting through the action of the oppressors, between speaking out or being silent, castrated in their power to create and recreate and the power to transform the world. This is the tragic dilemma of the oppressed, which their education must take into account. A fact which is not denied, but whose truths are rationalized, loses its objective base, and ceases to be concrete and becomes a myth, created in the defense of the class of the perceiver. It is always through action and depth that the culture of domination is culturally confronted. It is only the oppressed who, by freeing themselves, can free the oppressor as a ladder, as an oppressive class, can free neither others nor themselves in act of oppression. When it prevents people from being more fully human, that's when oppression is an act that prevents people when they are 
uh, from being fully human. The pleasure and complete domination over another person or any other intimate creatures is the very essence of the sadistic drive. Another way of formulating the same thought is to say that the aim of the sadism is to transform a man into a thing, something animate to something inanimate. Since by complete and absolute control, the living loses one essential quality of life. Freedom. I regret that with freedom, they only got one life to live. They only got one life to give. The colonized man will first manifest this aggressiveness, which has been just deposited in his bones against his own people. So, you gotta watch out because people, there's horizontal violence. The horizontal violence is when the people don't attack the oppressor that's actually causing the oppression. But instead, they attack each other. So I can see that very clearly in the black community. There's been lots of killings in the black community. And I think they understand the system. I think they understand um, more than what white people understand. But I think they're attacking each other because they're all equally oppressed by the white police officers and the white establishment and the white politicians. So... I like this one. Let me do this one again. So, the colonized man, say the West End, the West End, they'll first manifest this aggressiveness which has been deposited in their bones against their own people. This is the period when the niggers beat each other up and the police and the magistrates do not know which way to turn when faced with the astonishing ways of crime in North Africa. While the settler or policeman has the right to live long day to strike the native, to insult him, and to make him crawl to him, you will see the native reaching for his knife at the slightest hostile or aggressive glance cast on him by another native. For the last resort of the native is to defend his personality vis-a-vis -vis his brother. This is Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon from uh, the, the colonized. I mean, the colonized room, the colonized. I'll get it for the next one. Franz Fanon. How could the colonizer look after his workers while periodically gunning down a, a crowd of the colonized? How could the colonized deny himself so cruelly yet make such excessive demands? How could I hate the colonizers and yet admire them so passionately? The peasant feels inferior to the boss because the boss seems to be the only one who knows a thing and is able to run things. Not infrequently, the peasants in educational projects began to discuss a generative theme in a lively manner, and then they suddenly stop, and they say to the educator, excuse us, we ought to keep quiet and let you talk, because you're the one who knows. You know it all, and we don't know shit. They often insist that there is no difference in banking method versus education for liberating. The banking method is old and outdated. The education for liberation goes through the human humanization process, longing for freedom and justice, the struggle to power humanity, emancipation, overcome alienation. Time to get some affirmation, dehumanization process. It involves injustice, exploitation, oppression, and violence. You've got to emancipate yourself. The oppressor needs to figure out their identity. They identify as with who they rule over. Fighting the oppressor is an act of love, and it's the opposition to the lovelessness. It's fighting for love of oneself, and so therefore, since I matter, goddammit, I'm going to defend my fucking self. The sub-oppressor, the low man on the totem pole, who takes his authority way too far. Fucking rat shit. Fucking piece of shit. Fucking white supremacist who acts more cruelly than the boss. This could be a shift manager at the United Dairy Farmers or the white indentured servants who are promoted overseer to guard the black slaves, so it's a little bit of authority. The modicum. The white indentured servant didn't own the land, didn't gain an equitable interest in the real property of the massa, who gave them the authority, the fake fucking authority, for having white skin that carried on the long, live long day, all the way up to fucking today, some oppressors. Or like the house slaves ruled and commanded by the oppressors to humiliate, to demean and use fear and punishment to subjugate others, dehumanization and also the objectification of the victims. At Farmer Wilderness in Vermont, you got the boss and you got the staff support group and the camp counselors and the campers. That's four wrong hierarchy and it's very fucking clear political power for the Karl Marx is when one class of people oppress another class. It's exactly what the fuck is going on. Four wrong hierarchy where every motherfucking man is kissing the motherfucking man above stairs their ass at a liberal camp. It's forced fun, which isn't fun at all, but the oppressors don't care. They refuse to give up the power to be fully human. What is this grace that allows me to feel mercy for the murder or love for my perpetrator? Love for the perpetrator. My value springs from the deep belief that there is no separation between myself and women like Montezuma. 
Angel, Monsu Zhu, Angel, or the politician who dismissed her, even the soldiers who raped her repeatedly. I have an unshakable conviction that we are all one being created by a loving God. The oppressor is scared of being free. The oppressor loses their identity if they allow those who, who they have been oppressing to go free. That last quote was from Judd. Ashley, the violence of the oppressor is dehumanizing, but the violence in self-defense by the oppressor is humanizing by showing self-love and building one's dignity. The violence of the oppressor is humanizing, but the violence in self-defense by the oppressor is humanizing. It shows self-love and by building one's dignity. When you fight for yourself, you show that you got dignity and you're telling the oppressor that you aren't going to accept their fucking violence. When the oppressed become violent, it's putting love into a loveless situation. It's giving the opportunity for both the oppressed and the oppressor to liberate themselves from their hierarchy. Oppressor rationalizes their oppression through paternalism. 11 minutes. 11 minutes on. You gotta keep on fucking talking on. Alright, let's see what this mic microphone. Let's see if this shit is on. What? The oppressor oppressing for a good cause because they're paternalists. They think by being fucking white supremacists and paternalists that they can dictate and say they a daddy figure or mommy figure. The more radical the person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality so that knowing it better, he or she can transform it. This individual is not afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. This person is not afraid to meet the people or to enter into a dialogue with them. This person does not consider himself or herself the proprietor of history or of all people or the liberator of the oppressed. But he or she does commit him or herself within history to fight at their side. Leaders who do not act dialogically but insist on opposing their decisions do not organize the people. They manipulate them. They don't liberate, nor are they liberated. They're oppressing. If the structure does not permit dialogue, the structure must be changed. If you don't know who you are, then you can't fight for yourself. Without a sense of identity, there can be no real struggle. No one is born fully formed. It is through self-experience in the world that we become what we are. It is necessary for the weakness of the powerlessness of the powerless. The weakness of the power the weakness of the powerless is transformed into a force capable of announcing justice. For this to happen, a total denouncement of fatalism is necessary. You have relate they relate to the student in a patronizing way. These motherfucking oppressors don't know about us. The oppression, overwhelming control is necrophilic. It's nourished by the love of death, not of life. Trust is a dependency issue. Richard Rudd, ultimate freedom has nothing to do with your life circumstances. It's the freedom to, of allowing the self to dissolve into the waves of the ocean. It's a freedom that is born through one's absolute trust in life. To believe in love, to be ready to give up anything for it, to be willing to risk your life for it is the ultimate tragedy. Sometimes people hold a core belief that's very strong. When they're presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It would create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable, called cognitive dissonance, and because it's so important to protect that core belief, they will rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with that core belief. Franz Fanon, black skin, white mask. Looking at the past must be looking at the past must only be a means of understanding more clearly what and who they are so that they can more wisely build the future. The oppressors do not favor promoting the community as a whole, but rather selected leaders. I don't remember when exactly I read my first comic book, but I do remember exactly how liberated and subversive I felt as a result. Edward W. Said, Palestine. I'm sorry for those who have never had the experience of seeing the victory of a national liberation movement. And I feel cold contempt for those who jeer at it. Christopher Hitchens, page 22, a memoir. Between the working man and the master, there is a real disagreement. The master controls the working man. So you have lots of relations that have no real association. I'm of the opinion upon the whole that the manufacturing aristocracy, which is growing up under our eyes, is one of the harshest that have ever existed in the world. If ever a permanent inequality of conditions an aristocracy again penetrate into the world, it may be predicted that this is the gate by which they will enter. Manhood, to be a man, to be in control, and to have power, to be a man means that you have to be an oppressor. That's the definition of manhood. People who were formerly oppressed act like the oppressor when they get power because they think that's what men act like. And the definition of manhood is to oppress others. Not my definition of manhood.